I'm uh, Kirk Higby. I'm a, a jump professor here at uh, Northern New Mexico College in the Adobe Construction Program. And uh, I'm a student in civil engineering at uh, Arizona State University doing uh, research on uh, uh, Adobe architecture around the world. And so this week is an intensive course in basic Adobe uh, architecture, clear from the foundation, clear up to the roof. What the class is building is a bunko incorporated into a garden wall, but for the purpose of this, we're showing how to put a rough buck in with gringo blocks and other type of stabilization. The rough buck is leveled and plumbed within the wall, and we'll start bedding the uh, bottom with uh, adobe mud. This is the mud that just the bricks are made out of. So we're doing a sort section. We have more than 18 inches of wall on this side, more than 18 inches of wall on this side. We place the rough buck in. We want to have a sill on the outside. So we're placing the rough buck towards the inside of the wall. We're going to level it within the wall. And then we're going to plumb it within the wall also. And then it, it, would, it would already be braced to be squared. So there'd be a brace here and a brace here to have it squared within the wall. And if you, if you gentlemen would go ahead and start laying the, the adobes on each side. This is good mud. You can tell partly because you have some of that clay sticking on your hand like that. What uh, Mark is doing is placing this adobe as if it was the wall without the rough buck here. So he's just placing it in course, lining it up to the plumb of the wall, and then he'll level it within the wall. Are those blocks local? These blocks, some of them were made in a previous class. Some of them come from Rio Bajo Adobe. What would be the cost, approximate cost of block? Uh, commercial block. Blocks from Santa Fe now are about $1.30 a piece. So they're a little over a dollar now in some areas around here. Has that increased over time or is it constant? It's increased much less dramatically lumber or concrete over a period of 50 years. Jose is going to place a gringo block in on this side and on this side Maggie's going to place a piece of wood and the reason we're placing these within this uh, structure rough buck is so that you have a, a way of anchoring the rough buck into the wall and you stop the lateral movement like this and you're able to place your window casement within the the rough buck and it'll be level and plumb. Jose, you can tell, is just go ahead and do the whole thing. Just treating this gringo block as this is an adobe, making it solid into the gravity that holds it down in place. Uh, Maggie on this side has placed here, here. that piece of wood, which is very easy to screw into. Mark is going to cut a, an adobe in half using a hatchet. You score it on both, on all four sides, which Mark is doing very aptly. Perfect cut, Mark. Perfect cut. And Mark lays that into the wall, settles it down, and levels it. Was this uh, technology in place when the Europeans arrived, or did they bring their own style? The word adobe comes from a Syrian too. So that concept passed from Middle Eastern when the, the, uh, the Moors were in Spain, from Spain to here. But in the New World, the aspect of earth building has been around so it's much longer. Independent in and then place. melded. So here you had puddles, like you had agriculture. Right, like agriculture, like domesticating animals. The Europeans did bring over mud building because the oldest continuously used government building in the United States is the Palace of Governors in Santa Fe. Back east, the Europeans brought over wattle and daub and post and beam construction with infill mud. Paul Revere's house in Boston, Massachusetts is one prime example. You know, half of the world's population lives or works in earthen buildings. China has them, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Mongolia, uh, Africa, 
Peru, Ecuador, Mexico. It just, Everybody. just it's just everywhere on Earth, and even New York State. Yeah. Uh, South Carolina, Kentucky, yeah, yeah, Tennessee, yeah, yeah. Tennessee yeah. Alabama. Transcends, uh, climate. Transcends climate. The Scottish say as long as it has good shoes and a good hat, you can build an, uh, a mud house. It's Anne Hathaway's cottage in uh, England. Low technology, but high durability if it's built correctly. Well, you guys are just moving along. Nothing like being on the hill. Okay. Sorry. Is the uh, that's fine. Length and width of a, Pardon? a block uh, standardized? In New Mexico, the block is standardized. It's 10 by 14 by, by three and a four, half. three and a half. Why? Commercial reasons, basically. Yeah. They always weren't standardized. And in, in uh, Arizona, the uh, they usually build half adobes, and they're quite a bit bigger than this, 19 to 20 long, and uh, a little bit wider. But they build half, and they usually put an airspace in between because it's a great insulator, mostly from the heat. So you have two different climate uh, mm -hmm. aspects. Even Australia, when I was there, they had some buildings that had that empty cavity in the middle, and they did fill them up with uh, foam or some type of insulation, just left them. What are the, Here we go. the positives and the negatives? Uh, positives about Adobe. Adobe, it's a low technology, on-site, can be on-site, recyclable, reusable, earth uh, building material, low embodied energy, um, wood has to be milled, shipped, grown, cut. Adobe is usually on-site or close to be practical, it's close by. It can be recycled. It just melts right back into the earth, mm -hmm. or it can be torn down and refurbished and used again. It's not waterproof. So you have to build your structure anticipating that problem. The other negative is if you don't build it for earthquake seismic zone, it will collapse, but same as wood and concrete construction. Waterproofing yeah. it, there's old technologies, new technology. Stucco, lime plaster, asphalt emulsion within the brick, asphalt emulsion in the mud, cement, Portland, certain percentage within the adobes themselves would stabilize it. Then you have your natural products, locust bean gum tree, latex paint, cactus juice, dung from certain animals. Plus, you notice that some architectural features like straw in the mud plaster is a great deterrent because it wicks away. It is maintenance, but the thing is you do have to paint a wood house too. In Pueblo, Colorado, a study was done that they only lost an inch of the adobe within 10 year period. No maintenance whatsoever. Economically, if your adobes are produced locally, made on site, and your laborer is hired locally, you're keeping that money within your local economy. If you're buying the cement, 43 cents of every dollar leaves. The lumber is highly subsidized product of Canada, which means you're unable to compete, so that money leaves. But you're helping your local economy by building with Adobe because you're paying local labor. The labor cost is what's high in Adobe. Labor is an interesting issue. Is Adobe a growth industry? Or where are people trained to build Adobe? Northern New Mexico College is the only place in the United States that offers a degree in technology in Adobe. Why? It's native to the area. This institution has continued to offer that. The buildings around here are Adobe. This structure, that structure, that structure, that structure, this one is being repaired, probably because it's an economic thing. Steel, concrete, wood are all run by manufacturers, so of course... So this would have to be locally generated interest. Though. Right. But the thing is, we have a gentleman from Germany, we have people from Texas, Brazil, Brazil California, yeah. California, people from all over the world. We have a young lady. Coming from uh, Nigeria, two uh, Nigerians Iran. are here. Iran. Our, our doctor from Brazil behind you. That's marvelous. He's using plastic bags in the mix with Adobe. It's a world interest. If half of the world lives or works in the earthen building, it would make sense to get back on that bandwagon and be in an Adobe building. One of the things about earthen structures, they're either called a mud hut or they're called a palace. In Scottsdale, Arizona, the high-end houses are adobe. In Guadalupe, Arizona, near Tempe, the low-end houses are adobe. So when you build a house, you look to the high-end 
and you want to emulate that. And that's what the middle Most class people. looks for, is what's the high people building? So, personally, I think if you build adobes for, for the upper class, it'll catch on much quicker for the rest of the society. Because it's passive solar, if you build an adobe passive solar, if you build an, it has to be built that way. Otherwise, you're just building a box with mechanicals added on. So what you have is a thermal fly or a thermal. The, the, this is heated up during the day. It's the thermal. mass. The mass is heated up. Right. That thermodynamic aspect moves through the building. It, that warmth, that heat radiates within at night when it's cooler. So your building stays. You're, 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 having, you're having a constant. That's uh, fireproof also, isn't it? Fireproof also. What about insect proof? Insect proof because there should be no poo within the adobe itself. They're, the straw is used, not hay. Straw is only used when you don't have enough uh, sand. Uh, there's too much clay. What about adding things like uh, plumbing? Plumbing, uh, plumbing can be added uh, within that airspace. If you do a double wall, plumbing can be added within holes. You, you, you design within your bricks. Wiring is a special uh, underground feeder cable that can be placed forced within the wall or you can, you can uh, cut out channels and then mud them over. Are these homes ordinarily built on a concrete pad or? That normally they, they are now. Uh, you can build a rubble trench foundation. You can do a, a floating footing on a rubber trench. Well, why would it matter? Cost. Cost. Or you can build it right on the ground. Of course, you wouldn't be up to code, but uh, but many of these places around here have been built right on the ground. They've been up for over 100 years. You want to keep moisture away from the building. Are there laws that prevent the average person from doing his or her own home in no. Adobe? No. That's why we're here. That's why they're here. <laughs> laws and regulations are, are partly set up as, as safety to the right, to the course. homeowner. Yeah. And it's they're based on engineering standards, fire, Standards and uh, you know so in some areas seismic zones. So, but no, there, you can do an owner builder home in uh, much what's of the southwest. What's the future of it? Adobe? Adobe? I think building when I when I was here five or six years ago, we had two or three in class, and now there's 15 in this class. Huh. The last class that I taught in August, we had over 10. The class I taught a year ago, we had. Uh, 18. So I think you're starting. We're starting to see a, a much greater interest. Is in that seen in uh, permits for housing that you know about? Increased uh, permits issue for. I don't. I haven't house. seen an increase in permits, but I've seen an increase of people buying property and going out off the grid. Off the grid. Yes. Off the grid. Amen. So That's this would mesh well with uh, solar. Solar. Passive wind. solar. Wind. Uh, last August, we were up on one of the bluffs out here doing a house that was completely off the grid. And we were doing some adobe work on that. Completely off the grid. What about style and form? Is it true that you can sculpt the The, 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 uh, the adobe structure on Arizona State University campus, most people don't even know it's adobe. It's an Art Deco style, 1939. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. And the, the odd thing about it is it houses the Mars Exploration Team. So the Earth building on this Earth houses the Mars Exploration Explorer. The irony about that. The irony. Yeah. Yeah. And that building was built when the campus was experiencing a depression, 30s. It was a WPA, WPA Adobe. project. So they used the Earth on site. Contractors donated time. Students donated their manpower or human power. And uh, the building went up. East. Structures at Elephant Butte, WPA also. also, yes. And I think they're at Dolby too. And many of the colleges, uh, Pueblo Community College, has an Adobe gymnasium that was during the 30s. One of these structures was during that period of time, because the government was funding that type of uh, building at that time. Locally owned, locally produced, locally. Uh, yeah. In design, design. Look at this. Culture. Design, you can, it's, it's, it's quite organic or fluid. I'm um, Jim Conway, I'm from Dattle, New Mexico. I came to this course because um, building on a piece of property I have uh, in a rural area, uh, making my own bricks and doing a lot of construction uh, just with the 
as much of the construction as possible with just two of us. Is it part time? So, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, so we work, uh, you know, a normal job. What do you do job. ordinarily? Uh, we build websites and web-based uh, applications out of our home uh, in the little rural area of Dattle, New Mexico. Pretty cool. Yeah, beautiful place, right next to the VLA. My name's Jose Geronimo Marquez. I currently live in Dallas. My uh, mom's family's from New Mexico for 400 plus years from the Spanish settlers. So I bought some property just eight miles down here uh, near Abiquiu, and I'm going to move back to New Mexico in, in a few years and build an adobe. And I'm taking this program to learn how to build that, that house when I move here. So, looking forward to it. What do you do ordinarily? Aviation training. Um, I'm Suki Woodward and I'm originally from New Mexico. My family's been around here for a long time. I actually live part-time in Mexico, so I want to build an adobe in Mexico and an adobe in New Mexico. And I probably will start with the online courses here. I teach art history online, so I know the effectiveness of it. What do you teach? I teach at the University of Phoenix. University of Phoenix. And uh, I don't see how else I could afford a home unless I build it myself with my friends. It's appealing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bruce Silsby, and um, I'm going to enroll in the fall for the Adobe Certificate here. I'm from Austin, Texas, but I've been living the last 12 years in Morocco, North Africa. Where? Morocco? Yes. Oh, my goodness. And my house there was Adobe, and my workshop was Ram Dirt. What do you do there? I design and uh, export furniture from there. Morocco? Cash. Yes. Do you have a catalog? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a website. Yeah, well, hold on. I'll, I'll take your time. Here. Okay. Oh. That's but um, that's what piqued my interest, and I want to build in uh, in West Texas. I'm Plinio Santos. I'm from Northeast Brazil. I'm a professor of physics, but the head of an NGO that uh, builds uh, low-cost housing. And I'm here presenting a paper on the replacement of the vegetable fibers by shredded plastic supermarket bags, so that we can get really? some of that out of the dumps yeah, and start. put them inside the, the blocks and no termite will rip that and it will last longer than the fibers and we are applying some of that technology in northeast Brazil. Um, what happens to the plastic over time? It will take a hundred years to decompose. Much but it does. It does yes, decompose. It does eventually. Um, but uh, it will last much much longer than the vegetable fiber that goes in in the regular adobe bricks. We also braid the supermarket plastic bags and uh, heat reduce them a little bit with a solar oven and replace rebar uh, with oh. that. So it's a very, very low cost. You can build a three-story house oh. that's very, very sturdy by doing that. And we are presenting this paper here. That's Excellent. Stuff to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the technology is homegrown? or It's homegrown, yes. It has been homegrown in our little lab in, in Olinda, in Northeast Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mark Zainadin. and I work about 30 miles from here, north of, uh, about 20 miles north of Abiquiu in a place called Ghost Ranch. Uh, and I have a couple colleagues of mine who've been full-time in this program, the Adobe program. And uh, they would like to, st well, we'll be starting a youth service where we get youth coming to the ranch. And part of the project they'll be working on is building Adobe blocks, both for the ranch and the community. Awesome. You have a, uh, a museum there, too, I guess. Yeah, we've got uh, three museums on the property. Paleontology, fossils there also. Paleontology, yeah, a lot of dinosaur stuff going on there. Triassic stuff. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Who are you? I'm Maggie Seeley. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I work with small businesses to get them green. I use a model called the triple bottom line. What is that? People, profit, and the planet. So that there's a three-legged approach to making business decisions with high regard for planetary responsibility, including extractive processes, which are mining oil and uh, that's what I do for the major part of my career and the most exciting part of my career is teaching sustainability studies to freshmen through graduate students at the University of New Mexico. You're on the faculty there? I am. How long? Um, Ten years. What department? Uh, sustainability studies. Engineering, management, architecture and planning, biology, university studies. All come together. We have a minor in sustainability studies. So, and you're here why? 
because oh, I'm gonna build my own adobe house. Where? It's the only way to go. I'm building one in Cunha, Brazil, where oh, I have an eco village and the other one with my friend Suki up here in northern New Mexico. That's yeah. <laughs> well, hi there, I'm Quentin Wilson. And uh, this is, we're on the uh, shady part of the uh, breezy campus of Northern New Mexico College, right here in El Rito, New Mexico. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary for the college in, uh, in September. And um, I've been teaching the Adobe program here for about 12, 13 years. And Adobe is my big first love. And I'm also interested in solar and have been for many, many years. I grew up in Albuquerque. Uh, South Valley watching people make adobe bricks right along Sunset Road where I would be going home and fifth and sixth grade I was making little miniature adobes when it was time to make uh, model houses which you all used to use popsicle sticks and tongue depressors and I did it with uh, miniature adobes and so I've been interested in adobe since since that time and uh, moved to Ojo Caliente 1970 and uh, have an Adobe home, and in those days uh, there was no one in the phone book under the Adobe heading, and I had to learn everything that was needed to fix it, and uh, we rewired it and replumbed it, so I learned the, what I think are the easy, because I'm a lazy person, and uh, I, there's, one of the things I always like to mention to people is that uh, there's no Wilson technique, there's nothing that has my name on it, and I'm pretty strong uh, in advocating certain techniques, but none of them are things that I have developed, and everything that I'm advocating is what I think is the best, the easiest, uh, the quickest, and the cheapest way to do things from having observed this for, uh, we're now talking 50 years of my watching and doing Adobe. Where did you go so to school? I went to, uh, I finished up at University of New Mexico with a degree in physics, and uh, then I came up here, taught high school physics for a couple of years. Then I came to, that was in Ojo Caliente. Then I came here, it was uh, New Mexico Technical Vocational School around 1972 or three, taught math for a number of years. And then uh, I got tired of teaching fractions to carpenters when I decided I'd rather be out doing carpentry or masonry. And uh, actually I kind of attached myself to the masonry class and learned a lot of techniques. And then I did the old all American thing. I went out and started from the top and worked my way down. I, my first job, uh, was the director uh, of the Sun Dwellings project at Ghost Ranch where we what built the four prototypes in 1976 uh, of Adobe and we did a, a control unit uh, and then identical footprint buildings that were um, the direct gain, greenhouse and Tromwall. And so from then on I, I started moving back trying to fill in all of the skills I was missing because as the project director um, and the instructor I was teaching things that, uh, by and large, I had not done a lot of, but I was surrounded by some competent people. And uh, Ramon Dominguez taught me a lot of masonry. Mark, uh, he is the, the late Ramon Dominguez, and he was just, uh, not, not just, he was just an outstanding mason from Abiquiu, and uh, he was at Ghost Ranch, he was an employee. Mark Chalum was our architectural liaison. He was an architecture student at that time. And he then worked for William Lumpkins, and then Lumpkins has retired and is now deceased. And Mark Chalum has, uh, he does business uh, in Santa Fe as an architect, and I think he's the best of the solar adobe designers and, um, and solar analysts. And he will be here at the conference. Uh, also, Peter Van Dresser was the driving force behind the sun dwellings. He lived right here in El Rito and uh, El Rito was really one of the centers for development in uh, all sorts of what we would now call green, we weren't using the word back then, and uh, wind, solar, uh, adobe, conservation especially. Uh, who knows, but uh, Albuquerque North has always had a large concentration of people who were looking at different ways of doing things. Uh, Peter Van Dresser pulled a lot of people in here. He ran the, he and his wife had the coffee house here in El Rito. Uh, students came from many places to study with Peter and uh, to help work on his homestead. And um, so and he'd written a number of books and was pretty well known in planning circles and in sociology circles and uh, the human footprint on the land. So. Uh, that would, but, but in, incredible things were going on, uh, really from Santa Fe north. I would say Santa Fe, Española, Taos, and then these, all of these villages in the area, really was the upper cent, epicenter of much of the solar uh, movement in the uh, in the 70s. So Ghost Ranch, which is about um, 30 miles from here, really spawned the New Mexico Solar Energy Association. We uh, had a number of meetings there 
in the early 70s and decided that it was uh, something we wanted to continue to do and that and so the New Mexico Solar Energy Association was formed so uh, and that still goes on uh, how did the idea of the conference start well uh, the Germans uh, gave us the idea and uh, 19 uh, when well, actually it would have been I think it was 2001 uh, I had never been to Europe. We went to visit my son in Spain. I had a fresh passport, came back, and all of a sudden I saw that, uh, I just at the last minute saw the Germans were doing a, a, an earth building conference in, uh, in Berlin. And so I emailed them and said, is this too late to register? And they uh, said no. And the Germans, uh, the East Germans in particular, had developed a huge professional uh, group, uh, Doc Verban Lehm, Lehm, L-E-H-M. And they had about 200 members who were architects, engineers, and academics. And uh, the thing that not many people realize is that uh, there are two million historical earthen structures in Germany, primarily central Germany, which was East Germany. And uh, people turned to adobe in tough economic times. And for the Germans, right after World War II, the East Germans, they didn't have any money. And so they were building with adobe. Uh, oddly enough, they sometimes made sun-cured bricks, and it's more likely they were sun-cured on the ground the further north you go. Other parts of Germany did rammed earth just like this. So I visited entire villages that, uh, when they went to the communal farm systems, would have a couple of streets in one direction and three avenues in the other direction, and each street and avenue would have five or six uh, three-story rammed earth buildings. Each would house six to eight families. And uh, the ramming work, unbelievably, was done in about a week. The German government was very kind, and they said, if you can finish by Saturday, you get to take Sunday off. And so the people who would live in the homes, the government built the foundations, the people rammed the walls, and then they got to take Sunday off, and then they moved in the next week. So, uh, well, the rammed earth is what we're seeing right here, and here's, the, here's a completed unit of rammed earth, and it's slightly damp soil that's got clay, sand, uh, the, it, it needs a particular proportion between the clay and the aggregate, um, and it's placed loose uh, in a form, and here it is being hand tamped, and this is uh, our two instructors um, with his back to us is Luis from Lisbon, Portugal, and uh, Eduardo, uh, who's also from uh, over there digging dirt uh, near the shovel uh, with Stephanie. Eduardo's also from Lisboa. And uh, they have been really instrumental in, in spreading the way the Portuguese do this simple system. Uh, rammed earth uh, in this country is primarily done uh, on, a, on a much more industrialized basis. And the largest, uh, most prolific rammer in the world is Quentin Branch, who will be here this weekend. Uh, the most well-known of the Americans is David Easton, who's written a couple of books, uh, The Rammed Earth Experience and Rammed Earth Homes. I, I may not have the titles quite right. Um, and they both use... Well, the difference is the, the, do the work in Adobe is done by sunlight. Uh, we mix it up, and that's hard work. Uh, but the huge burst of energy in creating the adobe brick is it lies on the ground in a puddled form, uh, gelatinous mass, it is uh, dried out by the sun. And uh, so an incredible uh, BTU input, solar input, uh, and as it dries out, uh, the particles, uh, the clay particles, uh, associate with each other electrically and, uh, and pull everything together. And, uh, and we have a, a building brick uh, that is... Uh, that is strong enough to build any kind of building that almost any kind of well any kind of masonry building that we would be interested in can be done with adobe the rammed earth with the adobe bricks they're made in one place and then they're brought to where the building will be uh, and it may be a matter of 10 feet or 10 miles but uh yeah transported and then it's bricks and mortar uh something that most of us played with uh, i know i got my first little bricks and mortar kit when i was in uh, when I was about eight years old at Christmas, and so a lot of us have played with these little blocks. Sometimes they just snap together. So it's a familiar concept. The rammed earth, uh, large sections are put together, and in this case, uh, the, the slightly damp earth is pounded together. Uh, the same electrical interactions take place as the, as the particles begin to line up. They're kind of flat, uh, lenticular particles, and uh, I, uh, and blissfully ignorant of all of the uh, subatomic and uh, uh, superatomic and all these things going on, I basically come out of 
having built houses for 20 years, but we just know that by pounding it, we get a good solid wall and uh, that will stand up for many, is many the years. Is mixture sand and clay? Clay, yeah. The, the ideal mixture is 30% clay and 70% sand. Uh, this particular soil, we've got a very red pile over there that comes from Abiquiu. It has a lot of uh, silt in it. And uh, the, the, the strength of all of this comes from the sand and the, aggr the larger aggregate particles. And uh, the clay is what's sticking it together. And so if we have, uh, let's say if we've got 70% of the, uh, these, these uh, aggregate particles, including the sand, the, the packing void between them is around 30%. And so if we've got 70% of, of, of aggregate and 30% clay to fill in, then that sticks it together nicely. If we've got too much clay, the clay uh, swells when it is wet, and so as it dries out, it can contract and the bricks will shrink. But if we're at 30% or less, even if it shrinks, the mixture, uh, the, the blend can't shrink because the, uh, uh, the sand particles are all touching each other and, and they're strong and uh, they're not gonna compress and we get a good brick and we get good rammed earth. Now the rammed earth people actually can work with, a, with higher concentrations of clay because of the repetitive pounding. Uh, but the adobe folks really, uh, if, if we do that, uh, we can deal with higher clay but then if we get a lot of cracking, we might do something like adding the uh, straw, which we're seeing over there. I always like to just, uh, and, and you know, um, the thing about Adobe is that almost worldwide, people just go outside their door or where their door will be make and bricks. make the bricks right there. And so uh, almost always, if you can't find the right constituents right where you are, the easy thing is to dig down a little bit because sooner or later we're going to find another band of clay and another strata of sand or gravel. And so as we move up and down, uh, we're going to find what we need. Uh, we can also move to over to an arroyo or something. So the moral of the story is that uh, Moses went to a lot of trouble to obtain straw. He didn't need to do that. He could have saved a lot of problems for himself might have changed history a little bit, but if he had just gone up the wadi for a little bit of clay, I mean sand, to add to the clay, he could have made perfectly fine bricks and did not have to be controlled by other people who told him that he had to have straw. Does it kind of clay matter? Well, yes. Can any clay be used? Or not? not any clay. And again, I'm, I just, what I love to tell people, for, for, for 25 years yeah. I built houses, and I didn't know if I was dealing with kaolin or uh, bentonite clay or uh, all of these, you know, illite, I didn't know. But I could figure it out by fooling with it. Now certainly the, the bentonites which really expand are going to cause trouble. But I would suppose somewhere in this world there's somebody like around Dallas or Fort Worth where they have a lot of bentonite, I bet there are people who could figure out how to work with it and make a break. Uh, essentially what happens is wherever you are, as long as you stick with it for a little while, and the learning curve is only about 20 minutes, and after a while, people learn to where they are, make what they have, and work. And so that, to me, that's the real joy of Adobe. Wherever you are, uh, Dallas, Alaska. Uh, now, now, folks in Kansas have a tough problem because they got this all this horrid topsoil that they're farming that might be six feet deep. But usually, once you get down uh, to the grave diggers would find what they needed. Or people putting in septic tanks would find, get down far enough to get beyond the, the topsoils. And always in Kansas or Alaska, somewhere, there is a wash or an arroyo or whatever they call it where we're going to find layers of, of usable uh, soil. And uh, so what, what uh, you know, it, you can build an adobe home with almost zero cash input if you've got the time. And uh, right now, something interesting has happened in New Mexico, and um, Adobe has had the image of being for poor people. And in many cultures in the world, they, they feel like as soon as they can get out of their Adobe home, they want to be like the rich people who they see on television. But in, uh, in New Mexico, the rich people, and this started with uh, the Native Americans, the Pueblo Indians built with Adobe. The Spanish arrived, and they had Adobe in their culture. And so it didn't, and, and of course they came and they had the law of the Indies and uh, this, uh, 
uh, and, and I think this might have been King Philip at that time, I can't remember, uh, Carlos, I lose track, but their mandate was to come in and establish Pueblos. And, and so uh, being kind of like me, they come over the hill and they see a, a town existing and they say, wow, we can write home and say we've done a Pueblo because here it is. So in many cases they moved right in next to existing villages and adapted and adopted and there was a big interchange between the two cultures and how they built. And most people, uh, and I have believed this, and, and there is evidence that shows that I'm wrong, but most of the people believe that the Spanish introduced making the sun-cured brick and putting them together with mortar. But apparently there were some places, uh, and, and the people are leading this charge, is um, uh, um, Luis Fernando Guerrero Baca, who's at the, uh, uh, the Metropolitan University of Mexico City. And he is one of our authors, but I don't think he's going to make it. And, and, uh, but he's one of the people who said, no, we have found instances where uh, the indigenous people in the Americas were making adobe bricks before we, the Spanish, speaking for him, before we, the Spanish, came. Well, then here came these wave after waves of, of Anglos, and they came in and said, well, this looks nice. And, 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 but the thing is that the Anglos actually had this very same tradition. And uh, when the pilgrims hit the beach, they weren't building log homes. They didn't have the tools, they didn't have the techniques, and they were dirt poor, and they weren't builders. They were, they were pilgrims. And so the first desperate winters, they were building pit houses that the Native Americans showed them how to excavate and bring the brush up over, and they lived in very uh, simple conditions. And, but as they moved west, once they passed the Mississippi, Missouri River, there were no more trees. And so the U.S. Army, as it moved along, was building with adobe. So all of the, all of the forts coming across the plain suddenly were adobe. And so as the Anglos come in, as they move, as they move westward, they are developing uh, an adobe history uh, and culture. So everybody collides into Mexico. Uh, and 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 so and, and and instead of one culture saying we've got to abandon adobe, each yeah. culture adapts and adopts. Yeah. And and so now in New Mexico, it has the image of being the premium building material. And if a person looks at uh, Sotheby's, uh, Century 21, all of the big real estate companies, there's all the houses over uh, over 1.5 million are guaranteed to be either adobe or absolutely dead-on fakes. But then, in, in so, so New Mexico is the place that says, you know, adobe is wonderful and we don't have to be ashamed of it and it can house rich people. But in a way, that kind of works against us because then everybody thinks, well, only rich people can afford it. And so that's one of the things we're trying to show there is a balance. That a person can have a very fancy adobe home, but a person can also build a simple home and do it primarily with materials that they find. This this is a truckload that uh, some of my students went. We know a little place where uh, this this particular uh, blend is located, and it's left over from some old highway work, and and that made it easy for us today. But there are other places where we can get these blends. The, the red stuff from Abiquiu is delivered uh, by truck. Uh, and uh, but we routinely just go out here on the property of the of the college and dig up what we need. So you know the, the low technology exactly and uh, durable. Durable. Uh, you know, people. The, the, the biggest question is, that, or the most often answered, no, <laughs> the most often asked question. Well, how does Adobe do in a wet situation? And I like to remind people that wood rots uh, and um, insulation gets moldy or burns and steel rusts. And so whatever we're going to build, whether it's adobe or any material, we'd like to have a good foundation that gets us up above ground moisture. And we would like to have a good roof that keeps off the rain. And so once, it, once we make that step to have a good foundation and a good roof, what we put in between uh, is going to stand up just as well whether it's adobe uh, or wood frame or steel or whatever somebody else might choose. What are the positives and negatives of rammed earth? Um, my, my feeling is that uh, the learning curve for adobe construction with bricks and mortar is about 20 minutes. And, and, and you've seen the group of people right. over here. Some of them are very accomplished builders, and some of them have just been doing this for, and, and, and they essentially have the technique down. Uh, with the rammed earth, which is a wonderful way to build, first you have to learn some carpentry and how to make the forms, and, uh, and then after that, it's pretty easy. 
But I think my, my feeling in this country is that a person who's going to build one house, they're probably better off making bricks and doing the bricks and mortar technique. And, uh, and that if somebody is interested in rammed earth walls, that they might think about having one of the subcontractors. And we have a couple of them in New Mexico. Why? Just because the learning curve is high. And we have an unbelievably stunning, beyond belief building that's just been completed, hasn't even been dedicated, uh, and how it got built without my feeling the vibrations. Uh, 100 truckloads, semi-truckloads, went to Santa Fe for this huge rammed earth building. It's the new Para building, the uh, Public Employees Retirement Association, and it's rammed earth. Uh, and I, I did the calculations the other day. It's uh, Lockwood Construction. Uh, did the job, and uh, how in the world they got a hundred semis out of Ab Abiquiu without my, no I mean, <laughs> my reputation was blown one more time. Uh, but I blow my reputation about twice a week, and uh, usually Jim is there to document it with his camera. But he, he had something he could document early, and thank you for turning off the camera, Jim. I'm glad you, at any rate. Uh, so rammed earth is fabulous. But see, Lockwood couldn't find anybody who could handle that on a timely basis, so they did it themselves. But they have a highly, this is a, this is a, a, a corporation that's been around probably 50 years. They're on their second, maybe third generation. So they could bring their own skilled people in, work with standard uh, gang forms that are steel or aluminum, put those together, and then, and then deal huge volumes of dirt, and then power ramming equipment. Um, so, um, do they add things? Some do. I don't know about that building. Many times, rammed earth will have lime or cement added to it. Uh, as soon as you do that, though, then you have to have some kind of machine to blend. And if you were here earlier, we just drag this machine over here. It's our one. And incidentally, uh, this is this is a Conmore. It's Mexican made from Saltillo, Mexico. It's the most powerful mixer I've ever seen. And they had the good sense to power it with a Honda engine. But we just broke the starting rope. And we wanted to blend a number. Uh, the, the, the trick with rammed earth is that you have to blend things dry. And so, and, and we were thinking about mixing some of this pile with some of that. We can do it by hand, but we had the idea, let's see what we can do with the mixer. Uh, and with these large scale systems, they're using huge mixers. And they have to be very careful with their blends and they have to have it tested. And uh, they, they were under, you know, uh, very careful uh, scrutiny on part of the state because after all, it's my in retirement that those folks got down. To, well, no, I'm in the ERA, not the PERA. So, <laughs> so the rammed earth is dry or is water it's just, added to it? Or? A little bit. Uh, too much work to make the red and the. It's just damp, and 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 they have to get the mixture right uh, so that with 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 the ramming that it will that so it'll adhere. pound together yeah, okay. and so so that's and it's you know and that's what they have to learn by feel or of course in modern times you put the little the, the thing in it goes and the meter tells you where you are but nobody you know worldwide people are ramming houses right now there's a village in Colombia the time passed by when the Caratera went off in the other direction you go up to this village and they still build rammed earth if you get out of a bus you just hear the thump 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 and we've seen the same thing in Portugal it's just routine and part of it is, you know, I think it's just people being used to it. And and uh, see, Luis has been up there, and he's just ramming away, and he looks halfway happy. <laughs> and you know, uh, and 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 so we take big old American football player kids, and they do this for ten minutes, and they start to whine. <laughs> Is that the standard uh, size for the wall section? Uh, I would say. Uh, uh, this is about 14 inches. That's probably about a minimum size for... In a home project, would you build it by a section? Yes. Well, yeah, no. No. <laughs> if, okay. okay, if you're doing it yourself and you use the David Easton method that is described in uh, the rammed earth experience, yes, indeed, you do section and, and then uh, and you just keep... You, uh, he would, he, I think currently he would go up eight feet and you okay. just keep doing panels. We well, this is so. This is a farm, and they are they're moving right along. It looks to me like they're up about eight or nine inches. And uh, this is Stephanie Roselek, and she's taken some of my classes. And behind her is Jim Harford, who has taken all of my classes. And uh, this is Bill Barfus, and he's taken a couple of classes. And Stephanie, I am proud of because she uh, 
renovated an old adobe house and sold it last fall and is now starting off on another project. The house she did was over in Conhelone and uh, not Conhelone, Youngsville. I am sorry. And uh, where is that? It's a little village. West side of Abigail. And this is, this is probably about the first time. No, you were ramming the, two years ago. Yeah. So she's an accomplished rammed earth Bill, have you done it before? Rammed earth? No, this is the first time. I just signed up for the course. Yeah, the thing, I was, how are these joined? Uh, or you just keep going and going? There would be several ways it could be done. And, and some of the professionals will have a, uh, in the form, they might have something like a two by four that's slightly tapered. Uh, so that when uh, oh, much the, the way you make a keyway in concrete works, yeah, right, and right. so when this comes off, then the next one just keys into it. And uh, other people, uh, like myself, might say, you know, I bet I could do this just as I'm ramming. If if I don't have a if I don't have an end wall here, just ramming up against this uh, might be good enough. And I can see that this is a uh, the surface over here is fair. It's just like this one's fairly. We got some vertical lines, and it might hold together. Um, so, but I, you know, uh, don't there be quote a me on. Seam as well? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's all you, you, you always see, uh, almost always see a seam wherever the uh, formwork has been moved. How's it work? The seam it, sides over time. Good question. I, I and I'm, I don't think I've got the answer for that. It, it, that would be a, a, a weak place. Um, we might expect the first uh, water damage would be around the seams. Does it expand or contract? Or? Well, yeah, and, and, and actually what will happen sometimes where it's been pounded together, if it gets wet, it may just kind of burst small like, like we see here where it, uh, this was not from, from moisture. Uh, but you know, these walls hold up very well. Uh -huh. And um, I don't have that, that much of an ex experience, so at some point we need to talk to Eduardo yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and to Luis who uh, see much more of this in, in Brazil. And uh, you, you guys on camera too. That's right. <laughs> Luis and Edouard, and step right over here, you two. Come over here. <laughs> Come over here. <laughs> Tell us uh, uh, who you are. Well, we are architects from Portugal. Where you're from? Portugal. Yeah. Why you're here? We're here okay. for the conference, for the workshop. Uh, Can you uh, render? Pick up the sound? Yeah. Okay. This is at least the second time, maybe third time, that you've been doing rammed earth here on campus? Second time. Second workshop. Yeah. Is this a popular construction method in Portugal? It's mostly a traditional way of construction. It's not really? that popular. Yeah, most of the old buildings in southern Portugal are made with this kind Ramed of... earth is not yes. uh, Yeah, but it's not popular in the sense that most people don't use it anymore. So why not? <laughs> because now there's the modern way of construction with the concrete and the bricks and it's probably cheaper and easier to build. That's just the way. Really? Yeah. And you? you? Well, I'm partner with the part of You have your own company or? Kind of. It's a small company. Architectural firm? Yes. yes. Plano Bay yeah, is plan B. Plano Bay dot, is it org or dot com? Dot com. Dot com. Where in Portugal are you from? Well, well, we're both from Lisbon. Okay. And uh, that's where we work. Yeah. Which is a big metropolitan area. Yeah, it's the capital city. Yeah. It's not huge, I mean. Uh, skyscrapers and modern technology and concrete and pavement and cars and right, traffic and right. smog and everything else. Right. And Mercedes-Benz fire trucks so they're this wide so that they can, well, maybe this wide, <laughs> so they can navigate some of the small really? streets. And, uh, but I, I, and these two young men are part of the Portuguese uh, earth building group that had a big influence on me. The, the Portuguese put on fabulous conferences. And they, uh, what they do is uh, have them in world heritage sites. And uh, so the first one I went to was at Montserrat, which I never pronounced quite correctly. But Where is that? In the southern part. Why is it important? Well, it's on. It's a the, the Montserrat itself is a stunning fortification on the top of a hill on the border between Spain and Portugal, 
and it was this chain of defensive positions that allowed Portugal, I think, to remain independent. That just it was probably originally begun by the Moors, and the Portuguese maintained them, and so uh, and and then down below. Twelfth century. All of those centuries. Well, <laughs> and. Uh, I think some of the Moors were beginning the, uh, to do things in that part of the world like in the 10th century. Uh, and, and so then the actual conference was in a monastery down below. And, uh, and so they did a workshop to begin with. Uh, I did not get there in time for that, but they did rammed earth and they had arches and did all kinds of things. And, and then the, all of the presentations were in this incredibly beautiful uh, adobe structure. And then they had uh, two or three days of tours of, of historic and new work. I mean, there's incredible new work in rammed earth going on in, in Portugal. And they've done some of it. So, Is there a future for this kind of construction in Portugal, do you think? There are a few uh, architects uh, starting. Well, there are some that, are all, uh, that have already uh, they've, they've done it since they started to work. Yeah, but there's actually a few more architects joining this kind of buildings in, in Portugal. Young architects mm -hmm. starting. Is there an interest in uh, green yeah, that's the main technology? That, I would say that's the main issue for the. For is the it industry. increasing or is there a, a popular movement? I would say, and we're starting to get some contractors who are getting, uh, yeah, know-how to get these buildings done. Solar also? Yeah, of course. Too. Yeah, sure. That's the main advantage of this kind of... Is that because of higher energy prices or because of an interest in... I think it's mostly an interest in the green issues, <laughs> you know, ecological... I, I think there's a, a, a greater and more long-term interest in, in Europe in partly because they have this heritage and they can't go out and just uh, be doing wide-scale development like this country keeps doing and you know another 400 houses that way and they've had to be, think a lot more about what they're going to build and they certainly care about the traditions uh, and they have the laws to help them but also Europeans have been much more tuned to the green thing than, than we are uh, just so many things going on there uh, that we see, particularly at the conferences, and, and so the United States is certainly every other word now is green. We're being greenwashed, but uh, and that is good. But but we, I would say, we are well behind Europe and uh, and the Portuguese. Uh, I think the Portuguese all they have to do is maintain the lifestyle that they've been doing. They didn't. I don't. I think. I think. And I told Eduardo and Luis that I don't quite know why, uh, but I feel more at home in Portugal than the rest of Europe, and maybe that's why. It's just. Uh, it's it's they haven't done some of the things in the rest that the rest of the Europe has done that I that I, that I think are a little bit counterproductive. So Portugal, um, to me, is just a wonderful example of maintaining uh, the historical and traditional ways, uh, which all of a sudden now are, are the way of the future. Oh, are we having another? Here, so I'm on my way. Very well. <laughs> be there again. This time attractive. I may not leave. Maybe we need to go there. Yeah, I think we should. <laughs> I like that idea. I think Governor Bingaman, no, uh, Senator Bingaman will uh, help you with Senate. the funding. <laughs> no, we could manage that ourselves. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Well, this is a building that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure of its original purpose, but uh, it probably was the original purpose. It was a, uh, a maintenance building because the, uh, I have a huge door over here and another one over here, and they don't look to me as if they were retrofit. So I think it was built to uh, probably get vehicles here. The college, for a number of years, this was probably built in the 30s, and this was probably a WPA project. And the reason I think that is because of this, now this right here is, is rebuilt, but over here the original uh, foundations, uh, there are a number of WPA projects. There was a Civilian Conservation Corps encampment down the road about five miles, and these, these types of stone foundations are found in a number of buildings here on campus, and they're vertical inside, but outside they're battered, they're tapered, and they get, they get wider. And for many years, I thought maybe they had some kind of other foundation like concrete and they just put the stones against them, but no, uh, it, these are stones that are mortared together. And so that is kind of a, a WPA signature. 
And it wasn't just in New Mexico. WPA was doing these things. They built uh, uh, an entire school district in the Dallas area out of Adobe. Uh, they were building in, uh, I believe it was Alabama, Arkansas, one of those A states. Uh, I think Alabama. And, Socorro and, 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 also. Socorro, that's right. They built our courthouse, uh, old you know, high school, and every early paved street. Oh, wow. In town. I didn't know about the streets. Yeah. And, well, that's fantastic. Now I'm going to have to come down and visit you folks. And uh, so then this is an interior wall. It has a little less foundation. This had huge vegas, and it had a, and it had a dirt roof. And I'm sorry to say that for lack of maintenance, even though this was the maintenance building, there was a point where $5 worth of roofing tar would have stopped the leak. After that, there was a time where $50 worth of uh, roofing tar and roofing paper would have stopped the leak. And then uh, there was a point where it was going to take 500 and then one day there was enough of the leak and we could see some of the Vegas in here were looking bad and one of them cracked. Well, at that point, $5,000 could have fixed the building, but another Vega cracked and they just kept with this, you know, and Michael Valdez, who's the, uh, right now kind of the chief uh, of the facilities here, and I would watch this and just wonder why it uh, was happening. And so eventually it collapsed to the point, uh, and, and it was very unsafe, and these, these Vegas, once one went, uh, almost week by week. And our classroom is right up there, so we could kind of look out, and uh, you know, we'd have our uh, $10 betting pool on how long it'd be before the next Vega went. So it got cleared out, and uh, will be rebuilt, and there is some money. There's a huge pile of adobes on the other side of this building to rebuild this. Now this part of the foundation has been done, uh, the college hired some, uh, some local guys to come in and it's rebuilt and we still have their string to keep it lined up. So this is now ready for adobes. Uh, rebuilt as what? As a that, building? I, oh, okay, I believe that at one point this was going to be the student, uh, uh, the student center. And that's why one of the first things that happened was the fireplace here got built. And, uh, uh, this was done by Neil Bachman, a local, uh, a local mason, and this happens to be a modified Camp Rumford uh, fireplace in that it's, uh, it's tall and the firebox is pulled forward and most of it is, is revealed. There's very little hidden wall, so, so most of these surfaces can radiate out. Uh, so a Camp Rumford is, is more efficient than most fireplaces. And Neil was one of the people who was pioneering modifying these uh, corner Kiva type. And so this is regular fire brick, and then uh, these were actually adobes that they borrowed from me from the adobe program to do the surrounding parts. And so uh, I wasn't in on the thought process. process. Uh, some, some builders like to do the fireplaces first. Some builders like to do them last. Uh, I happen to be uh, of the group that likes to do them early in a project. But we also are seeing some problems here that, that uh, this wall, uh, we can now see there's, uh, we've, we've lost bricks down here, and I don't know what's holding things up here, uh, and we're going to have a little bit more collapse here. But the amazing thing is how, uh, how this building is held up. And there's, uh, we see this, uh, once, the, once the roof was gone, this became an exterior wall. And this is very, uh, uh, worldwide, we see the coving um, when either rain or moisture coming up from the ground, rising uh, damp, rising moisture. It's a worldwide problem, and going through freeze-thaw cycles, the adobe just falls off. And so, uh, right now, uh, this wall, which was uh, 14 inches thick, right here we probably have 8 inches. And uh, uh, fortunately, it's tied in, uh, but something needs to happen here fast. Fortunately, it's an easy fix, and somebody just needs to go along and get rid of all the loose stuff and then really just pack this with new adobe mud and replace it. So it shows up uh, flexible and repairable. That's exactly correct. Adobe. And, uh, but at some point, it's like over here, once we've had so much, uh, that wall needs to be torn down up to the, up to the lintel. But uh, what's nice... Uh, covered in uh, stucco in... Uh, yeah, this probably actually had, uh, my recollection, it had a, a cement-based stucco uh, in Probably in the 30s, it was easier to get a hold of cement and lime than to get a hold of gypsum. And uh, actually, some of these rooms uh, were mud plastered. Like right over in this corner is mud plastered. Well, here's. Uh, well, I, I went right past. It. Okay, so here is mud plaster. So it might have had one or two courses of mud plaster. 
least I think that's, it may be mud, but a very slight uh, amount of cement and lime in it. And so, so we find on the, on the campus here uh, all sorts of plaster. Uh, now these bricks have been put together with, with a mortar that looks to me as if it's got a little bit of, uh, of uh, cement in it. And particularly on the outside, it has the gray color. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of just putting to adobes together with a, with a standard mud mortar. I don't see the reason to have a, have a cement-based mortar. The only reason to do it is sometimes if you're getting into cold weather, uh, it's, it, uh, this, uh, it, it cures uh, through chemical reaction rather than drying through evaporation. So sometimes the curing process is faster with cement. But I love these big, huge lintels over the over the openings. Where would openings. they have come from? Uh, they well, almost certainly would have been from uh, if there were a, a local sawmill, uh, either here right in El Rito, or uh, there were sawmills in Vallecitos and La Madera. This was one of the large timber reserves of New Mexico, right back up in here. Big trees. As a matter of fact, just for your benefit, I think the first government use of the word sustainable was the Vallecito Sustainable Yield Unit, which is this part of the Forest Service right up here. And it was either 1938, 1948, when the federal government set the Sustainable Yield Unit uh, aside with the idea of being that it would be managed to be sustainable, sustainable. rather than, uh, you know, the harvested in such a way that uh, it, 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 and, and it is still, uh, has that, has that designation and is being harvested. So, uh, so these easily could have come from the Vallecitos Sustainable Yield Unit. And they went to the trouble of creating the rounded corners? That's right. <laughs> these are the gringo blocks that are going to hold windows. That took effort. So they, uh, yeah. I mean, here's a solid uh, piece of wood, probably a 4 by 10, 4 by 8 that they uh, beveled. And here they nailed together two bys to create the same effect. I don't know what in the world I'm seeing up here where this uh, lower it's probably be a big shim that they put in, and right. it looks to me like they've chiseled that, maybe to, to follow the plaster yeah. line. I, I hadn't ever noticed that before. Why did the concrete blocks for the fireplace? That, that's, that's the ah, pitiful modern times, we have to follow the code. And uh, okay. it, it, we find uh, worldwide, example after example, where somehow certain codes don't recognize that adobe won't burn. And so uh, you have to do the firebox of a, a modern uh, permitted Even fireplace in, in New Mexico. New Mexico. Yeah, we can't they do it. Realize we, adobe won't burn. That's right. Uh, the people who do the fire code uh, uh, or fireplace codes, if they're national codes, are uh, probably not from here. And uh, it's a battle that we fight. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, you could save money on uh, fire insurance from your for, on your adobe home if you clad it in aluminum or uh, and uh, neither one of those is uh, any more fireproof than adobe itself. And, uh, now I'm seeing over here in this corner, this is this very thick cement-based uh, plaster here. The yeah, and so this is pretty incredible. We, we must be looking thick. at many layers of plaster because it's uh, two to three inches here. And uh, I'm pretty sure that that was carried up at least to about this height. I sort of remember that there was kind of a wainscot of, uh, of plaster and then it, it made a transition. Uh, although, so yeah. This uh, original stucco? Th this, is pro this is probably stucco. Uh, well, not probably. This is stucco, yeah. including the metal mesh, and uh, so this would have been uh, cement, lime, sand, stucco. Uh, is it painted outside or painted? Yeah, yeah. Uh, painted. Painted. Now this is, and then of course this is. This was an interior wall, right. and and then outside it would have probably had. It wasn't so easy in the 1940s to get color. So they they may have painted the exterior. 